This is Reverend J.W. Smith, pastor of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road, Memphis, Tennessee, 38127. New Salem is a growing church for growing people going all out for God. We want to thank you for joining us today uh, at our 11 o'clock worship stream, reminding you that in three Sundays, that is the first Sunday in February, we will be going back for live service. Uh, and we welcome you to join us. We will continue the video stream uh, for those who care to sit home and watch. We will be allowing live service on the first Sunday of February at 11 o'clock. Reminding you again that each Thursday at 12 noon to 1 and on Facebook and shortly thereafter on YouTube, we do continue our Sunday school broadcast. And on Sundays from 11 to 12 uh, on Facebook and shortly thereafter on YouTube, you can find our worship stream. Uh, since the, we've been doing the pandemic, we've been shut down for a while, and I've been doing the message from home. But we will do live streaming again, starting from the service sanctuary, starting the first Sunday in February. Uh, again, we want to just thank you. I, I pray that you enjoyed the flashback we played on last Sunday uh, from June of this year. Uh, and we thank God that we had a chance to just look back into the sanctuary and see how God was blessing us. Uh, again, we're here today, and God, we're praying again for Mother Valerie Johnson and the loss of her son. Uh, we're still praying for Sister Lily Pittman, and the loss of her daughter. Uh, we're praying for all those that are grieved and bereaved these days, reminding you that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. We serve an awesome God as we get ready to move into this message for today. I just want to kind of always, as normal, give you just a little praise music to set you in the mind of praise. If you're, if I look crooked on your camera, again, don't try to adjust your screen because I, I have, as old folks say, a crook in my neck. Um, hey Amen. it's better to have a crook in your neck than a crook in your heart. I may sound a little hoarse today, but that is okay too. Not at my best, but my God is always able. Uh, let me give you some little worship music, amen, that, that will put us in the mood for giving God the praise. Yes, Lord. God's grace. It was God's 
By the grace, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. <laughs> By the grace. How many know with God's grace? Yes, Lord. I made it. By the grace. Yes, Lord. Look at me. Look at me. I'm sit down and look back. Yes, Lord. Again, we thank God that he allowed us to be here. We made it thus far by the grace of God. Amen. It is not of our works that any man boast. We're sinners saved by faith through grace. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be, but I've got a pretty good guess. Based on my pretty good guess in the word of God, I thank God that he looked beyond my faults and supplied all of my needs. Amen. We want to thank you for participating in us in the worship hour today. Uh, we're going to come to you with this message to remind you that there are blessings available to us that we can't even understand, we can even comprehend. Amen. He says they do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. So we want to move this message today. And I remind you that we're praying for Mother Valerie Johnson. We're praying uh, for Sister Lily Pittman. Amen. In the loss of children. Um, and I've never lost, I have not lost a child based on what I know about losing any loved one. Uh, it is a difficult task. So we pray for those. We pray for them, uh, asking that God would undergird and move into the situation and give them what they need to make it through the trials. I want to look at St. John chapter 11, verses 41 and 43, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. St. John chapter 11, 41 through 43, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Amen. Giving you just a second. We are reminding you that on three Sundays from now, first Sunday in February, it is our plan, unless the Lord does something drastically to change, alter our plans, we plan to be back in the building on the first Sunday in February from 11 to 12 o'clock. We will be going with an abbreviated service still, and we ask 
uh, that you follow as you join us. You allow us to take the temperature. Uh, I'm wearing a face mask and we will follow uh, the CD, uh, CDC guidelines as closely as possible. Again, I apologize for how I sound, but I'm glad that I'm able to make a sound. Amen. It is by the grace of God. God bless you. St. John 11, 41 through 43. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. You find in the words in St. John 11, 41 through 43, words, and Jesus took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. Because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, and he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, um, fourth. And then I want to look at 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. You find this, words of Paul. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man, things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And that word says, but I hath not seen, neither nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, things which God hath prepared or them that love him. That's God's word for his God, for God's people. And I want to deal this morning with how to be blessed beyond belief. How to be blessed beyond belief. How to receive exceeding and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. How to be blessed beyond belief. Two characters in this opening. One is called Brer Fox. And one is called Brer Faith. You know the story of Brer Fox and the grapes? This was Brer the statement of Brer Fox. Fox said, this situation of getting these grapes, hopeless, it's hopeless, because the grapes are beyond my reach. And because I can't get the grapes on my own, then these grapes must be sour anyway. So based on his ability, Brer Fox goes away with sour thinking that what could have blessed him sour because he couldn't get it. On the other hand, Brer Faith says, even though I'm not where I want to be, looking back where I was, I see how far God has brought me. Are you with me? And he says, I don't believe he brought me this far. Believe me. Are you all with me? So Brer Faith says, even though the situation is not like I want it to be, I know the God who brought me this far did not bring me this far to leave me anyway. So Brer Fox leaves in sourness. Amen. Brer Faith continues on in faith. We tend to be more like Brer Fox than Brer Faith. We give up on our blessings without ever putting up a fight, simply assuming that our blessings are not worth fighting for. Most of the times, our blessings are disguised as trials. You get that? Most of the times, we bypass the real blessings or the fake because our blessings are disguised as trials. God sends us trials, amen, to help us see and understand our blessing. Without a trial in your life, you would not appreciate nor understand the value of blessings. Things that come easy to us, amen, go easy. You heard the saying, easy come and easy go. But our blessings are hidden in trials. Watch this. You cannot get to the diamond until you put pressure on the coal. Gold comes hidden in rocks. Coconuts come in tough shells. And you have to go through the outer dark cloud to get to the silver lining. This is what this is saying. Everything worth anything is hidden in something else. Did you get that? Everything worth anything comes hidden in something else. Things that are easily obtained are those of the least value. Because if it's easy to get, everybody's got it. Are you with me? The best grapes are the ones that Grail Fox calls sour. Amen. The best grapes are the ones that Brer Fox calls sour because God 
took them up out of the way. Notice when Brer Fox was trying to get the gecko's grave, he had to jump up. Amen. God raised those grapes up for two reasons. One, he raised them up above the heads of Brer Fox's enemies. Amen. And number two, he raised them up so that Brer Fox, when he looked to the blessings, he would see God. That's why when Israel was attacked by serpents, God told Moses to put a serpent on the pole. He lift the pole up and tell Israel, amen, when they begin to become bitten by the snakes to look up and live. Are you all hear me? But the enemy wants us to believe that God created barriers to keep us from his blessings. But that is not the case. The barrier is not designed to keep you out. But it's designed to protect the blessing until you're ready to receive it. Hello, somebody. The barrier is not designed to keep you out. It's designed to protect and preserve the blessing until you're ready to receive it. If you remove the shell from a coconut before it's ready to be eaten, it will drain and dry out. If you remove the peel from a banana or an apple, they will turn brown and not and, and become inedible before you have time to eat them. These barriers are put in place by God to keep the blessing fresh. And I wonder today, is there anybody out there who needs a fresh blessing? Uh-huh. But if we're not careful, Satan will use his angels, or even he will use us as to, to create our own barriers to God's blessings. In Daniel 10, God sent Daniel word. It says, Satan fought with an angel for 21 days, holding the blessing. Until Daniel re inquired of God about his blessing, and God sent the archangel Michael to help deliver the blessing. John 10, 10, the Lord says, the thief come not before the kill, the steal, and destroy. I've come that you might have life, have it more abundantly. But our problem is that we block more of our own blessings than Satan ever could. And that's all because we cannot and will not deal with the ifs of God. Watch it, that little tiny word, if, amen, is the biggest obstacle, the biggest barrier for many of God's blessings. We can handle the long words, amen. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is no problem for us because we love the world to know that we can say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Amen. It's a big word. But a little word if. Amen. It's what we trip over. Amen. We don't we don't we don't fall over big things because they're easy to see before you get there. It's a little bit of things that trip us up. And in God's word, it is the if. Amen, somebody. People love to quote Second Chronicles 7 14, where God said, If my people to call by my name. We know that verse, but we but, but, but we fail on the if every time. Amen. John 15, 7, the Lord said, if he abided me, in my word in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. But that if pulls us off, which keeps us from being able to get all of the blessings that God has from us. The blessings of God come right behind the if of God. Did you get that? The blessings of God come right behind the if. Amen. But Satan uses the if to represent a barrier to being blessed. To be blessed beyond belief. Psalms declare that we must meditate the word of God both day and night. Amen. It's not a part-time situation. We must learn to meditate, not quote, not read, but we must learn to meditate. That means to eat and digest mentally and spiritually word of God. And it must be done both day and night. Day and night represent more than just the time of day. Day and night represents the all times. Amen. That's presented by the psalmist in 34. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her both in the Lord. Who oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. When? Both day and night, at all times. Amen. If you're blessing God at all times, you have no time to spend cursing anything else. You get that? If I'm going to bless the Lord at all times, I have no time for other conversation. That means I'm going to bless the Lord 
I'm up when I'm down. I bless the Lord on my good days and my bad days. I bless the Lord in times of joy and sorrow. I bless the Lord on my hills and in my valleys. Are you all here with me? In order to obtain the crown, we must endure the cross. And the larger the crown I seek to obtain, the larger the crown I must endure. Are you, are, are you here with me? See, because the crown itself has weight. And to be strong enough to bear the crown, the cross, doing the cross gives me the strength to bear the crown. Otherwise, the crown that I seek may crush me. Y'all hear me? There was a story about this man who was bearing a cross. He complained to God that his cross was just too heavy. It was unfair, God, that you would put this big of a burden on me because it looked like my load is heavier than all the others I see. So God said, an angel, this man said, take this man up to the crown room. This man went in the crown room and he was amazed. Angel said, here, lay your cross over in this corner. The man laid his cross in the corner. Angel said, now choose a cross of your, of your desire. The man looked around. He was amazed at the magnificent cross. He saw crosses laden with gold. Crosses full of jewels, stars, sapphires, and diamonds. He saw silver crosses. He saw crosses of all designs. He said, these are the most beautiful crosses I've ever seen. He began to notice one thing. He said, these crosses are, are, are beautiful, but they're so big and so massive, I cannot carry them. And he said, well, continue to look on and find the cross that you can carry. The man kept on looking. In the corner, he saw a small cross. He said, I believe I'll take that cross over there. The angel began to smile. The man asked the angel, why are you smiling? The angel told him, this is the same cross that you brought in this room. Are you all here with me? Are you all with me? We think our cross is less than until we understand the weight that, that some are carrying to bear the crosses they have. The cross is the home office, Christian blessings. Amen. It's the corporate office. It's the headquarters, of Christian blessings. And the more you stay beneath the cross, the greater the blessings that you will receive. Some I said at the cross, the cross where I first saw the light, the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. Now I'm happy all the day. At the cross is where you receive your cross, your sight. At the cross is where the blood you receive will never lose its power. At the cross is where he's able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. At the cross is where we receive the gate where the gates of hell should not prevail against us. At the cross, we receive the keys of the kingdom of heaven and earth. And whatsoever we bind, he bind, God shall bind in heaven. And whatsoever we lose in the earth, God shall loose. So that's what happens at the cross. Our text today, John 11, you see two more characters, Mary and Martha. Their brother Lazarus needing, is need of, in need of a blessing because Lazarus has been sick. It looks like he's on his deathbed. Mary and Martha send Jesus to come, saying, The one thou lovest, amen, is sick. Now, Mary and Martha, Lazarus, three good friends of Jesus who lived in Bethany, a short walk outside of Jerusalem. Every time Jesus came to Jerusalem, he would always abide with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Amen. There they cook for him. There, his feet was washed with their hair. There, they met all of Jesus' needs. They were unquestionable friends of Jesus. But watch this. Friendship with Christ does not preclude your headaches and heartaches. You all hear with me? Be a friend of Jesus. Does not remove, that does not mean you're not going to have headaches. Does not mean you're not going to have heartaches. Why? Because Jesus died to save us from sin and not from suffering. Did you get that? When he died, he didn't promise to save you from suffering. It's the exact opposite. Amen. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. He didn't die to save you from suffering. He died to save you from your sin. So don't get upset with Christ because 
you have to suffer. One songwriter said, I've learned how to live holy. I've learned how to live right. I've learned how, because if I suffer, I gain eternal life. Amen. So suffering is what purges us. It is what cleanses us. In Romans 5, Paul says, we glory in tribulation. Knowing the tribulation work with patience. Patience experience. Experience hope. And hope maketh us not ashamed. Because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts. Amen, somebody. So again, we must understand that Jesus never promised to save us from suffering. As a matter of fact, suffering or pain are signs of growth. You go, when your feet grow, you know they grow because the shoes you used to wear causes pain when you put them on. Are you all here with me? One detective said, if you want a man to confess, put him on a pair of shoes, two sizes too small. He'll tell everything you want him to know. When teeth grow in your mouth, especially a young baby, that's, that, that it causes pain. And when one teeth has to be pulled for another to grow, that is a sign of growth. You know you're hungry. Why? Because of pain. Amen. So most of the time when we deal with things that grow in our bodies or in our life, there's some pain associated with growth. Now, Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha request a, a, a blessing from the Lord. They say, Jesus, the one you love. Amen. Don't, don't, we're not basing it on our love for Lazarus. We're going to base it on your love for Lazarus. The one that you love is sick. But Jesus delays wherever he is. Now, Mary and Martha have a hope. They have a hope that based on our relationship with Jesus, that he'll stop whatever he's doing and come see about them. Now, watch this. They look past what Jesus must do for others. They feel like Jesus ought to drop everything and everybody to come and see about them. Jesus is now preparing them for a blessing beyond belief. They're asking for a blessing, a regular blessing, based on what they think they deserve from the Lord. They're asking a response based on their response to the Lord. They've been good to Jesus, so they feel like Jesus ought to be good to them. But Jesus said, if I hold on a little while longer, if I tarry and delay my coming, I'll be able to bless you beyond what you believe is possible now. So the Bible said Jesus delayed his coming for a little while longer. After a while, he tell his disciples that, G, that, 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 that Lazarus is already dead. His disciples say, Jesus, why do we go now? Lazarus is dead. He said, this is done. That God may be glorified in order to have a blessing beyond belief. We must allow God to be glorified in our lives. It's not about saving Lazarus' life. It's not about Jesus responding to my call. It's about seeing Christ and God in a brand new life. God bless somebody. And so in this message, how to be blessed beyond belief, we must do three things that's demonstrated in this lesson. You all pray for me. The first thing we must do is have a call to Christ. A call to Christ. First thing we see is that Mary and Martha recognized that they could not handle the situation. But they recognized Jesus could. Are you with me? The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Be not thine own understanding, all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. It shall be help unto thy navel and marrow to thy bones. So the first thing they did was recognize that Christ could handle what they could not, because man's extremities is God's opportunity. And so what was the a hopeless situation based on their power, amen, was a hopeful situation in the power of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing they did was send a call to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one I love is sick. Now watch this. They never use the word, come to me, Jesus. 
He just said the one I love is sick. And they understood or they felt like just knowing Lazarus was sick was enough to bring Jesus into the situation. The songwriter said he will hear my faintest cry and he will answer by and by. But a, a strong relationship with Jesus will yield a strong faith in him. But we must call him in faith, not as a favor. Are you all here with me? But they call him in faith, but they implied the favor. Are you all here with me? They knew Jesus could handle it, but they wanted Jesus to come as a special favor for them. But I came to tell you that true faith is not based on a favor. Let me pause there. True faith is not based on a favor. You see, we don't obligate Jesus by what we think we've done for him. A favor is based on what you've done right in the past. If I did you a favor, then you owe me a favor. If I did you a good deed, then you owe me a good deed. And so, even though they called Jesus knowing that he could fix the situation, they called him also based on a favor. And it was a hidden favor. They didn't say, Jesus, come. They said, the one you love is sick. Are y'all here with me? We must always remember, no matter what we've done in his name, God does not owe us anything. Do y'all get that? The songwriter says, the Lord never does anything else for me. He's already done enough. The reality is not only has he done enough, he's really done more than you deserve. But y'all here with me. So Mary, Martha demonstrates that we must learn to call Jesus when you are in trouble. When problems arise in your life. You got to learn how to call on Jesus. He may not come when you want him. I promise you he will be right on time. Not only must we call on Christ, we must cease complaining. Cease complaining. The biggest problem in the Christian church is the existence of complaining spirits. Church folk, amen, I'm not saying Christian, but church folk complain about anything they can find. And we spend more time looking to find something to complain about than we do to uplift the name of Jesus. Watch this. They had enough faith to call him, but they did not have enough faith to endure. Are you with me? They had enough faith to call him, but not a faith to endure. In other words, they had a hundred yard dash faith. They didn't have enough faith for the marathon or the relay race. And this lack of faith, upper faith, leads to complaining. You all heard me? Because a 100-yard dash runner runs his 100 yards. If he has to go further, he's out of win. And so he starts complaining. Nobody told me it was longer than 100 yards. Nobody told me the race was going to be this long. He starts finding reasons to complain. Amen. Because he finds himself inadequate to meet the call before him. But God hates playing the spirits as much as we do. Now watch this. Some of you hate complainers. Those who are positive, you, 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 you hate answering certain phone calls. You hate seeing certain people in the grocery store. Why? Because they're always complaining. And you will be in a good mood and they pull you down. They're able to do that. Why? Because what they have will rub off on you faster than what you have rub off on them. Are you with me? A negative spirit will rub off on a positive spirit faster than a positive spirit with a negative spirit. Why? Because our nature is negative. You get that? Man has a negative nature because of sin. But if you think you hate to be around the complaining people, and you're just around a few of them, imagine being God dealing with the world of complainers. He's dealt with complainers ever since Adam and Eve. You all here with me. And he and he finds we are still complaining. 
complaining spirit is what made Adam and Eve satis dissatisfied with the garden. <clears throat> now, if you went to the garden, you realize the Bible says man had everything he needed. Everything was prepared and made for man before God put man in the garden. He had dressed the garden. He had brought cattle upon the earth. He brought trees and shrubs and food, everything man needed before he created man. But when man got there, Satan got in his ear and said, you know everything God has done for you. You know the fact that mosquitoes don't bite. You know the fact that dogs and cats are getting along. You know the fact that it never storms in the garden. You know the fact that there are no wars and no rumors of wars. You know the fact that everything in the garden is at peace. Let's look at one thing we can't complain about. That one tree God told you not to eat of. Now remember, everything he said you shall eat. There's one tree in the garden you shall not eat. Satan said, look beyond all the things God has done for you. And begin to focus on the negativity of the thing God said you cannot do. Well, he said, don't worry about the fact. And God says, stay away from it for your good. And anytime God says, don't do something, he means it for your good. But Satan turned it around and told them God did that. Because God was holding you back. Amen, somebody. I wish I listened to some things my parents were holding me back from. I thought they were old. I thought they were unlearned. I thought they didn't know what was going on in the world those days. And so when they told me not to do something, I felt like I didn't know. They didn't know what I what I didn't, they didn't know what they were talking about. But now that I look back over my life. There were a lot of things my parents kept back from, tried to keep me back from. But they didn't mean it to harness me. They meant it for my good. Y'all hear me. The plain spirit is what caused Israel to miss the promised land. And one in the wilderness for 40 long years. God told Israel that when you get to the promised land, you'll find a land of milk and honey, large grapes and pomegranates. When they got to the Jordan River, they sent over spies to look at the land. The spies found everything they said. When they got back, they said, look, past the fact. This is the promised land. Let's look past the fact. It's full of milk and honey. Let's look past the fact that it has everything God said it has. But let's talk about the giants that we see over there. Are y'all here with me? The giants that are there make us look like grasshoppers. And based on the situation, they look past the million things that God had promised and respond to the one thing that looked beyond their power. They forgot it was God's power that brought them out of captivity in Egypt. They forgot it was God's power that brought them across the Red Sea on dry land. They forgot it was God's power that fed them with manna from heaven. They forgot it was God's power that gave them the law at Mount Sinai. They forgot it was God's power that gave them water from rock. And I stop by to tell you, any God that can bring water from a rock is able to bring down giants in the promised land. Y'all hear me? Because they look beyond what God gave them and look at the barrier they thought they saw. God promised banish them into the wilderness of wonder for 40 years. And they wandered 40 years Give all the unbelievers a chance to die. For the complaining spirit, they called John the Baptist, asked Jesus, are you the one? Or shall we look for another? It was John the Baptist who leaped in his mother's womb when Mary walked in with Jesus in her womb. John had so much faith that it went from womb to womb. And when Jesus, uh, the feeders walked in, he said Jesus is worth praising even as a fetus. And John looked back from his mother's womb and heard what Isaiah said. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
did the Lord all right. He looked back to what Isaiah said in 7, and this shall be a sign that a virgin shall have birth a son, and his name to be called Emmanuel. Ain't God all right? He looked and saw John 3, 16, that said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son from his mother's womb. He saw the precious man of glory. From his mother's womb, he saw bread over troubled water. So when Jesus walked in uh, in his own mother's womb, uh, John began to leap. Uh, ain't God all right? Uh, and from praise come praise. Uh, when John got to praise in his mother's womb, uh, praises filled the room. Uh, and Mary began to say, uh, my soul uh, does magnify the Lord. Uh, is the Lord all right? Uh, but that same John, uh, he came out uh, in the wilderness. Uh, Preaching to the world, huh? prepare ye huh? the way of the Lord. Huh? It was the same John huh? who baptized Jesus huh? in the Jordan River. Huh? Ain't God all right? Huh? And when Jesus came up, huh? the Holy Ghost came down. Huh? When the Holy Ghost came down, huh? heaven opened up huh? and he heard huh? the Father saying, huh? This is my beloved Son huh? in whom uh, I'm well pleased. Huh? Is the Lord all right? Huh? After all that witnessing, after all that preaching, and all that baptizing, now for the same cause, John finds himself in prison, and he in prison is still trying to praise. But some words came to John that made him begin to question. The word was, John, while you were here in jail, people are praising Jesus. Let me stop there. Because this is what gets us. We are called to be his promoters. Amen. But the promoter is never bigger than the project. Are you all with me? The promoter should never get more attention than the project. Amen. Angelo Dundee never got more fame than Muhammad Ali. Y'all hear me? <clears throat> a sports agent should never get more publicity than the athlete. The promoter promotes. When the project takes the stage, the promoter is unseen. Are y'all hear me? But they put something in John's ear. They said, John, you are suffering in jail. But Jesus is outside preaching. John looked past the fact that what happened is supposed to happen. Y'all hear me? John now decreased. Jesus to increase. The popularity that Jesus is gaining. The sign that John did what he came to do. He said, prepare you the way. Make the path straight. For the Son of God is now on the scene. And the kingdom is at hand. Well, if Jesus is gaining popularity, if Jesus is growing, then that means the work you can do is bearing fruit. But they put in his mind, John, it should not be this way. You ought to be as big as Jesus. And our problem in the church today is many of us want to share the glory with the Lord. Somebody say, ouch. We've got preachers, deacons, my members, mothers, choir directors, musicians who want to be on the same stage with the Lord. Y'all hear me? That's why God on the Mount Transfiguration, when Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, one of Moses, Elijah, and the Lord. The Bible said God sent down a cloud, and Moses and Elijah appeared, and there was nobody there but Jesus. God said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. You all hear me. I didn't come to hear a particular preacher. I didn't come to hear a particular singer. I came to learn more about Jesus. So y'all hear me. Complaining spirit is what caused Judas to betray Jesus. For 30 pieces of silver. I got to get out of here now. How to have how to have a blessing beyond belief. We first must call Christ. 
then we cease complaining. As I leave you, the thing we must do is come clean. Now you all praying with me. We cannot come forth until we come clean. Mm -hmm. We cannot come forth until we come clean. We must remove our death rags. Those things which have dressed us up. It dressed us to death. Y'all hear me? Our death rags. Those things which magnify the body. You heard somebody say, <coughs> you're casket clean. Casket clean means good enough to be dead, which means I dress, most dressed up dead in our life. It's when we are unable to do anything for the Lord. But we must learn to come clean. <coughs> when Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave, the first thing he said was take off those rags. Amen. Dress him properly. That references our righteousness before God. Our righteousness are as filthy rags. It means while we think we're dressed up, we look good on the outside. Because on the inside, God sees it's filthy. And so Paul says we must learn to lay them aside. We must learn to take off the rags of selfishness. Take off the rags of personal glory. Take off the rags of human grandeur. And lay them aside because they don't impress God. For the Bible says man see the outside, but God looks at the heart. We must learn to take those rags and shake them off like the goat in an old dug well. Are you here with me? And when we undress ourselves, we allow God to redress us. Amen, somebody. And the record is that we don't know how to dress ourselves because all we know is what we've seen and what we've heard. Somebody help me. And But what you've seen and what you heard and what you know is not good enough to represent the things of God. And that's why Paul says, for I have not seen Ear uh, had not heard, uh, neither entered the hearts of men, uh, the thing God had prepared uh, for those who love him, uh, which means what God has for you, uh, you, you, your eye had not seen it, what God has for you, your ear had not heard it, what God has for you, uh, your heart had not loved it, because it's a blessing uh, beyond your belief. Uh, and so Paul says, in Ephesians 3, huh, we serve a God uh, who is able huh, to do anything but fail. Huh? He can do exceeding huh, and abundantly. Huh? Above all, uh, we ask God think, huh? ain't God all right? Huh? Be remember huh? when Naaman came to Jesus huh, and said, Lord, huh, I want you to heal me. Huh? Jesus said, uh, go dip yourself huh, in the Jordan River huh, seven times. Huh? Ain't God all right? Huh? Naaman made up her uh, in his mind, uh, said, Lord, uh, you must not know uh, who I am. Uh, I'm a man of means. Uh, I'm a man of power. Uh, I'm a man of wealth uh, and a man of notoriety. Uh, how dare you, Jesus, uh, tell me uh, to go dip myself uh, seven times uh, in some muddy water. Uh, but the problem was not uh, that Jesus uh, did not know Naaman, uh, but Naaman uh, did not know Jesus. Uh, it did did not take her uh, in a hocus pocus. Uh, it did not take her uh, a healing service. Uh, but if you can believe uh, in the word of God, uh, you can be healed uh, in the muddy water, uh, in that water, uh, naming saw snakes, uh, in that water, uh, naming saw mud, uh, in that water, uh, naming saw catfish. Uh, but what he didn't see uh, in that water uh, was a power of an almighty God. Uh, and God all right. Huh? There were ten lepers huh? who stood in the way huh? and they saw Jesus huh? and said, Lord, <coughs> we would huh? that you would heal us. Huh? They might have been waiting 
or something special, an incantation, a holy dance, a, a holy sin. And God, all right. But Jesus said, uh, turn and go. Show yourself to the priest. When they followed Jesus' instructions and began to turn, they were all healed. And one level, he saw the healing and said, I cannot go until I tell the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank God, all right. I'm going here now, but I came by to tell you, if you want her, bless me, young Jesus, you got to learn to give your life uh, to Jesus Christ. Um, you got to call on him. Uh, he may not come when you want him, uh, but he's always on time. Uh, and then uh, you got to learn uh, how to come clean, uh, to stand naked uh, before God <coughs> and say, Lord, uh, here I am. Uh, send me. Uh, I'll go. Uh, whatever you need, God, uh, I know you able uh, to do anything but fail. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that know God is able? Uh, when you need <coughs> a little blessing, uh, you got to learn how uh, to hold on uh, to Jesus, uh, and he will uh, make a way for you. He's able uh, to do anything fail. Uh, in Malachi, he'll open up uh, the windows of heaven <coughs> and pull you out a blessing uh, that there shall not uh, be room to receive in Psalm 23 uh, the Lord is my shepherd uh, and I shall not want uh, in Psalm 1 3 uh, he shall make me uh, <coughs> like a tree uh, planted by uh, the river of water and I uh, shall not be moved uh, in James uh, 1 and 7 uh, every good uh, and perfect give uh, come from the Lord <coughs> which is above in whom uh, there is no variance. In Philippians uh, four thirteen, uh, I can do uh, all things uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, which strengthened me. Uh, in Philippians uh, four nineteen, uh, and my God uh, shall supply. Mm -hmm. All of my needs uh, according uh, to His riches in glory. Uh, in Psalms uh, one ten. If I stay uh, on his right side, he'll make my enemies uh, my footstool. Uh, no weapon uh, formed against me uh, shall ever prosper. Uh, the battle is not mine. It belongs uh, to the Lord. And God, uh, and y'all right, and one uh, of these days, uh, I'm going to receive a blessing beyond my belief uh, because I have not seen it. <coughs> and why am I lying for a blessing like that? Uh, I'm in line because Jesus, uh, he bore my cross. Uh, <coughs> and God, all right, one Thursday, he bore my stripes, uh, 39 lashes of a cat and nine tail. Uh, I'm going uh, because that same Thursday, <coughs> they took 72 thorns and put them in his skull. I'm going to receive it because Friday morning they put a cross up on his shoulders and he marched up a hill called Calvary. They hung him high and stretched him wide. He hung his head and then he died. They buried him in a barber tomb, but he didn't stay there <coughs> right early in the Sunday morning. Listen, right early Sunday morning. Jesus got up, stood on cemetery store, looked toward heaven, and said, All power is in my hand. Now I'm going here now. I want you to know I've had folk in my life that they stick around when you're down, when, when we're all down together. But when they get up, they don't want to deal with you. But Jesus gave me that Sunday morning, a blessing beyond belief. That right, he rose with all power. He was no longer called carpenter's son. He was no longer called son of a carpenter. He was no longer called <clears throat> a joke from that. But Jesus <clears throat> is now on cemetery soil, has the keys to hell, death, and the grave. Look for help with all power. In his hand. <clears throat> but after he looked toward heaven with all power, <clears throat> he looked back toward me. He said, despite what men say about you, despite what you're going through, <clears throat> despite your heartaches, 
in spite of all your pains, let not your heart be troubled. He believe in God, be also in me. In my father's house, I'm in a mansion. And what I told, I would have told him, I'm going uh, to prepare a place for you. But where I am, maybe also, in God all right, and some glad morning, when I read my title clear, some glad morning, <coughs> when I hold my hymn book, Lord, is going to call my name. And I don't know about you. I want to be somewhere listening to my name. And I shall behold him. I shall behold the Son of God. That's a blessing beyond belief. I shall behold the Lamb of Glory. It's a blessing beyond belief. I shall take off corruption and become incorruption. I will take off mortality and become eternal. It's a blessing beyond belief. I put on a long white robe. I walk the streets of glory. There's a blessing <clears throat> beyond the lead. I'm going to land where the sun never go down. There's always how to how to and never good back. That's a blessing beyond belief. I've got to quit. <clears throat> my soul is happy. Amen. But my voice is giving out. But oh, what a blessing. The song says on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. It's all past. I'm home at last. I'm a rejoice. Oh, I want to see Jesus. Look upon his face. <clears throat> there to see ever of his saving grace. God bless you. It's God's word for God's people. Remember, this is Pastor J.W. Smith from St. Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road. Remember, said it to Tennessee. Our growing church for growing people. Reminding you on the first Sunday of February, three Sundays from now, we'll be going back into the sanctuary. Until then, may God bless you. God keep you. Thank you.